Every time you take an airplane to go to your vacation, you'll cruise somewhere around 41,000 feet, well above the peak of Mount Everest, somewhere you would definitely need an oxygen bottle to survive. So why don't you need one on your flight from London to Madrid? The jet aircraft are the fastest and the most efficient at high altitudes, where they can benefit from lower air resistance. As the airplanes started to reach higher cruising altitudes though, it quickly became apparent that it will be necessary to protect the crew and passengers from the number of physiological problems caused by the low outside air pressure. The air mainly consists of molecules of oxygen, nitrogen and argon. The concentration of oxygen in the air is around 21% and remains constant to 100 km. But as the aircraft climbs, the atmospheric pressure decreases exponentially. At 16,000 feet, the pressure is about half of the pressure at sea level. And only a third at 30,000 feet, the summit of Mount Everest. As the atmospheric pressure drops, so does the partial pressure of the oxygen. This means that the oxygen molecules get further apart and we get less of it every time we breathe in. When unprotected, Climbing to high altitudes, the human body would experience oxygen deprivation, or hypoxia, starting with impaired thinking and vision, hyperventilation, loss of consciousness, and ultimately, death. The lower the air pressure, the faster and more pronounced the effects are. While at 25,000 feet we could function without any difficulties for around 3 minutes, at 41,000 feet it's only 10 seconds. We call it the time of useful consciousness. So why is that we can fly day to day at cruising altitudes of 41,000 feet, well above the summit of the highest mountain in the world without being attached to the oxygen? Well, it's because the aircraft cabin is pressurized and the cabin altitude is kept well below the ambient one. Most of the airliners are utilizing the biggest compressors there are available to pressurize the passenger cabin, the jet engine. This is CFM 56-7B26 engine powering the Boeing 737. It has set of compressor blades mounted on a disc, rotating at very high speed, up to 15,000 rpm. These discs follow one another and are there primarily to compress the air for combustion and to create thrust, but we can use some of it to pressurize the cabin. In this engine, the air from 5th and 9th high pressure compressor stages is extracted into the bleed air system. The air from the compressor can reach temperatures of up to 232 degrees Celsius or 450 degrees Fahrenheit. With peak pressure of 60 psi, too hot to be supplied to the cabin just yet. That's why the air goes into so-called pressurization and air conditioning kit, or more commonly known the pack, before it can be supplied into the cabin. The hot bleeder enters the pack, where it goes through a set of heat exchangers which are cooled by the outside rum air. From there, the bleed air continues to the air cycle machine, where the air expands and cools down further. This whole process refrigerates the air to pleasant air temperatures. Should the air however be too cold now, the pack would use a bit of bleed air which bypasses the refrigeration process to warm it up a bit. To make the air conditioning and pressurization system redundant and to be able to meet the air supply demand, there are two packs installed. Now that the air is at room temperature, the only thing left to do is to distribute it. Our Boeing jet distributes air from two packs into three zones. Fly deck for pilots, forward and aft passenger zones for passengers. It starts its journey below the deck into the mix manifold and rises through the ducts into the overhead distribution ducts. From there, it is distributed evenly throughout the cabin to the passengers, through the outlets along the sidewalls and the central ceiling of the cabin. The pressure in the cabin is simply formed by more air coming in than we allow to leave. To control it, the aircraft uses so-called outflow valve. This flap located at the aft part of the fuselage, opens and closes to regulate the amount of air leaving the cabin. It closes on takeoff and opens on landing. As the airplane climbs, the cabin differential pressure rises. To increase the lifespan of the fuselage and to provide some safety margins, it is not possible to maintain the cabin altitude at sea level. 
The pressure differential limit between the outside air and the cabin is set to around 9 psi. When the aircraft reaches its cruising altitude of 41,000 feet, the cabin altitude is around 8,000 feet. That's right, the cabin altitude copies the flight profile, but in a much smaller scale and it's always kept below 10,000 feet, which is a regulatory limitation set across the globe. New composite materials, like the one used on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner and the Airbus A350, enable higher cabin differential pressure limits, and thus lower cabin altitudes. The cabin altitude on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner is kept around 5000 feet, that is 3000 feet below the 737. This way the passengers on a long haul flight arrive into their destination less fatigued. Remember how we got the pressurized bleed air? That's right, we stole it from the jet engine. But it wasn't for free. The more bleed air we take, the less efficiently the engine will run, contributing to a higher fuel burn. Now in order to reduce the bleed air demand and improve the fuel economy, we recycle the cabin air before we get rid of it. Recirculation fans draw cabin air through filters into the mix manifold and distribute it back into the cabin. If for some reason the cabin pressure drops and the cabin altitude gets above 10,000 feet, the flight crew will receive a warning. When the cabin pressure drops further and the cabin altitude rises to 14,000 feet, oxygen masks will drop in the cabin. This can also be triggered manually from the flight deck. In the Boeing 737, each row has its own chemical oxygen generation system, which has four masks for each passenger row. Once the oxygen masks drop, the oxygen doesn't flow just yet. One of the masks in the row needs to be pulled down first in order to activate the oxygen generator. Once activated, it cannot be stopped. The oxygen generator starts a chemical reaction and provides oxygen for around 12 minutes. This provides the flight crew just enough time to descend to a safe altitude. The flight crew have their own full face masks when on demand oxygen supply from a separate tank. This oxygen supply lasts much longer than the passenger oxygen. I hope that you learned something new today. If you'd like to know more about the aircraft systems and specifically more about the 737, download our 737 Handbook app where you can benefit from interactive simulations, technical articles and videos.